we want to welcome back our brother Ron Marklef. We just can't seem to shake him. Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to be back here again. I love being here. Um, and uh, some of you know that I drive about six hours to get here, but it's nothing. But I didn't get up early this morning and do it. I came in yesterday because I'm smart now. By the way, it was great to start the service today with um, I'll Fly Away. I thought I was in Nashville. I, it was great. I, I love that song, and I especially enjoyed hearing a big old Johnny Cash voice from Mike. <laughs> Perfect job, good job by you. I want to thank my usual uh, hair, wardrobe, and makeup people, uh, Mike, Ray, and Lori, and now we add AJ to that mix too, thank you. Thank you for your help to help me get ready for all of this. I want to talk about something today that looks like this. Ray, if you put that up on the screen. It, it's not the heart with hands, there it is. How many remember this from like 25, 30 years ago? How many wore one of these? I did. You, you, go ahead. It's all right to raise your hand. It was very popular back then, and I'm not sure exactly how it got started, but it caught on, didn't it? People wore the, the bracelets that look like this. Mine is for, the one that I wear today is for being part of a police department as a chaplain. But we all wore these bracelets, and it had the WWJD on them, and of course it all stands for, say it together with me, what would Jesus do? It was a good reminder. And yet in no time at all, those of us who wore it or those of us who would say the expression got teased mightily in our culture, didn't we? They just took us apart. They just thought that that was the, the weirdest thing and we took a lot of heat for that, but we all kept wearing them because it was a good reminder. And so as I was thinking about this, um, I, I have a pastor buddy that I read some other things that he did, and he gave me this idea. I started thinking about, well, instead of wearing a, a bracelet that says, what would Jesus do? I was thinking, why don't we talk about some things like, what would Jesus undo if he were here? And so, Ray, if you go to my next screen, what would Jesus undo if he were here? Sometimes Mr. Murphy of Murphy's Law hides in all of the technology and the wires, and it doesn't always go the way you, you think it would. So, what would Jesus undo if he were here? And our topic today that we're going to look at is something that he talked a lot about when he was here. The answer to what would Jesus undo if he were here is not this candidate or that candidate being in or out of office, this set of political agendas being adopted or that. Jesus would be talking about undoing the very same things that he tried to undo when he was here, and he did. Today, we're gonna to look at one of them that he would, what a big one that he would undo because he talked a lot about it. And in fact, scripture is full of it. Right, if we can go to the third slide, what would Jesus undo? Pride, pride. He did it when he was here. If he were here back here today, he would want to undo that once again because pride is the original sin of all of mankind. It is what got the first family, Adam and Eve, into such trouble and started all of humankind down a path where we are born as enemies of God. You don't have to teach a little kid no, do you, when they're learning how to talk. My children probably learned no right after they learned mom when they were little, and all of yours did too. We are by nature and experience opponents of God or as has been said, we are opponents to law and order. That's how we become made. And it all has its root in pride, the pride that was in the first family with Adam and Eve. It was, it was Eve who was deceived into thinking that she could know and be like God if she would reach out and touch what she was told not to touch. It was Adam's pride that he thought he could get away with it just to be able to keep his bride. Pride is the initial first sin. 
and it's bedeviled human beings from then till now. And pride is nothing more than you and I and everyone who's ever lived thinking that we know better than God. And I have to confess, there's a lot of times when you look at the political landscape today, or you look anywhere in the world, pick a spot, Somalia, the Ukraine, pick your place. I would say, looking at those things, that well, this is not how I would run the world if I were in, in charge. I wouldn't want to see this level of bloodshed and violence and, and hideous things going on. I wouldn't do this. Well, that's, that's me excusing my pride for some high-flown noble ideal, right? But there's plenty of times in, my, in the normal course of my day or the week where I think, man, if I, if I were God, I would not have done that. But if I were God, I would not have sent my one and only son to rescue me from my sin, which we'll celebrate in just a few minutes down here at this table. Pride is the beginning of it all for human beings being goofed up. And we're all goofed up. That's a modern translation from Romans chapter 3, that all have sinned and, they have, and we have fallen short of the glory of God. We are goofed up people. And pride is the initial jumping off point. But what I would like to, to look at today is not the normal passage or not the normal sermon or not the normal explanation of pride, because a lot of you have heard this before. I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands, but a lot of you have heard this before. So I'm going to approach this from a different angle. I want to show you something in Scripture that I didn't see until mm, about two years ago. I'm shocked at my age and having read this passage so often that I missed this. I'm supposed to have caught all that, right? I went to Bible college, I went to seminary, I'm supposed to know everything. Well, the Bible is beyond knowing everything in those few eight years or six years, whatever that was. I saw this a couple of years ago and I thought, uh-huh, I'm, I'm going to teach this from this vantage point, so I'd like to teach it to you now. So I think what I should do is stop and pray for all of you and me that we'll see things maybe that we haven't seen before and get this from a fresh perspective. Is that a deal? Is that a deal? I'm glad you said yes, because we'd be here to one. All right, let's pray. Father, we admit that we are sinners. We admit that we are full of pride, all of us, from the time we're born till the time we die. And I'm asking for clarity from your word this morning, and I am asking for you to help me to be clear and help people to hear it clearly. And we'll need your Holy Spirit to do that. So we are appealing to him in this moment, asking for uh, that kind of clarity. Thank you for your word. Thank you for being the God who loves us in spite of what we are and who we are. The, the very same God who sent his unique and only son all the way from heaven to earth to fix our problem of sin and fix our problem of death. You did that. It was your choice. You loved us enough to follow through on that. And we thank you in that name of Jesus. Amen. So as we look at the subject of pride, I, I told you we would look at it from a, a different angle. I'm going to get there in just a minute. I'm going to show you this first. Where does this whole pride thing start? Well, the whole pride thing actually doesn't start in the Garden of Eden with that first family. It starts long before that. I don't know how far before. But there was one creature that God created. He was the most beautiful, talented, intelligent, brilliant, and compelling angel that he ever created. His name was Lucifer. And one day, Lucifer, as the most intelligent, most beautiful, most compelling, with all of the gifts and all of his abilities, somehow he decided that he would sit on God's throne. Now, I don't know, I don't know how much more intelligent he is than we are. And I don't know how much more beautiful or compelling or talented or gifted than we are. I know it's got to be a lot. It's got to be enough that he really thought that he could unseat God from his throne and sit on that throne. Now, those of you who are Jesus followers, I'm looking at a bunch of people that I think are. If you're a guest here today, welcome. We're glad you're here. But how could 
even among the highest order of creation of the angels, how could they think that they could unseat the very creator? Doesn't it, by definition, make sense that th that which is created cannot dictate to the creator? Doesn't it make sense that it really could never happen? We don't know the whole story because somehow in Lucifer's mind, he thought that it could happen. And he has set about from then till now to make it happen. Now, we know, those of us who are Jesus followers from what scripture teaches, we know that he will not win. But he knows stuff that we don't know. And it's not like I'm suggesting, well, he could win. I think he's talked himself into thinking that he can win, even though we know what his end is. But I think there's other parts of this story that we won't know till we are on the other side that explain how could, even the highest angelic created being, how could he possibly think that he was going to sit on God's throne? I'll, I'll read it to you. This comes from Isaiah. It's in um, chapter 14. This, I'm, I'm going to read it to you out of the NIV. You might have NIV, you might have the KJV or the new KJV or NASB or NLT or CIA or BVD or IRS, whatever you have, get it out and we'll look at chapter 14 for just a few verses. This is Isaiah the prophet, 600 and some odd years, 700 years before Jesus was here, and he's speaking prophetically about this Lucifer, and this is what he says about him. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of the assembly on the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high but you are brought down to the realm of the dead, to the depths of the pit. This is Isaiah the prophet writing about this fallen, brilliant angel named Lucifer. Today we know him as? Today we know him as? Thank you, this is not a library, don't worry. No one's gonna throw you out for talking in church. So this whole pride thing starts with the most brilliant angelic being that's ever been created. And it got me to thinking, is there a, a singular passage in scripture which sort of is the ground zero for all of this jumping off in human beings? Well, yes there is, and you all know it. And you've heard it before. And this is where I'm, I'm going to get a little, um, maybe coming at this from a, a different angle than maybe what you might be used to. It's what I saw a, a couple of years ago. So what I'm going to do is instead of reading from Genesis chapter 3, in whatever version you have, instead of reading all of Genesis chapter 3, a passage with which most of us are very familiar, it, it's the story of the fall of humankind. I'm not going to read through everything, but I'm going to read selected verses, and here's what I want you to, to do. It'll be a little quiz. Uh, I'll have gold stars out in the lobby for you to put on your forehead to take home later. We're going to do a, a little quiz here. I'm going to read selected passages through this whole, first, or this whole third chapter. And this is what I want you to listen for. I want you to listen for the names or the titles of the people that are involved in the story. Listen for the names or the titles of the people involved in the story in Genesis 3. Everybody good with this? Nod your head so we won't be here till 1. Good. Okay. Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Skipping down a few verses, 
Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? Skipping down a few more verses to verse 13. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed. Skipping down a little more to verse 21. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground which he, uh, which he had been taken. That's all the selected parts I'm going to read. Anybody got it yet? Anybody figure it out? And, and don't feel embarrassed if you didn't, because I lived a long time in my life until two years ago when I saw it. Anybody got it yet? And if you do, be loud and proud and, and say what it is. All right. This doesn't mean that you're not an aware church. It means that you were in the same boat I was for 68 of my years until I finally saw this. Let me do it again. Not all the same thing. I'll, I'll just do some of it, but I'll put some emphasis on it for you so that you will get it, okay? Back to the beginning of, of chapter 3 of Genesis. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, the serpent, did God really say, you must not eat from this. And the woman said, but God did say, you will not certainly die, for God knows when you eat. <clears throat> then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of day. But the Lord God called to the man. Then the Lord God said to the woman, so the Lord God said to the serpent, and the Lord God made garments, and the Lord God said, and the Lord God banished. Do you hear what the difference was? You hear it now? What is it? Call it out loud. And God. Interesting, don't you think? There is not one word in scripture that doesn't belong there, and it's always there on purpose. Human beings wrote the scripture, but they were directed by God's Holy Spirit. We're reading through this whole chapter. It's Lord God, Lord God, and then God, and then God, and then God, and then Lord God, and then God again, and Lord God. That is no accident. Do, do you see it now that there's a back and forth thing going on here? Now, you would think, as I did, for so many years reading over it, well, it's the same thing. It, I mean, they're both titles of God, right? Yes, they both are titles of God. Good, I'm glad we're still nodding so we don't have to be here late. They are titles of God, but there's a reason why there's this back and forth thing. First of all, God. God is the Hebrew word today and then called Elohim. Everybody say that, Elohim. Okay, a version of that word was what Jesus said when he was hanging on the cross, when he said, Eloi, Eloi, and he's quoting Elohim in Aramaic then. That's a little piece of, of the original word. Elohim means the supreme one or the mighty one. It's a great universal catch title for God. I'll circle back around to that in the middle, in, in a minute. The next, the next title that we see is actually part title, part name. It is Lord God. Now, in your versions, whatever you have, Lord is spelled capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. It was done that way in the Hebrew to signify this word, Yahweh. Everybody say Yahweh. Yahweh. 
Yahweh means in Hebrew the eternal self-existent one or if you want it literally from their language I am who I am and what is meant by that is God is the only entity in this whole universe that can claim present tense for every time period that he's in any and all time periods that have been in human existence and before and after he can always say I am in the present because he lives in the present with everything how many have heard that before go ahead you, you can raise your hands it is true that that I am means that he lives in the present tense no matter what the time period this is actually his name Yahweh Moses when he's confronted by God as a younger man and God says to Moses you are going to save my people you are going to march into Pharaoh the most powerful man on earth at that time the world's reigning superpower you're going to march into his presence and you're going to say let my people go and we're talking about millions of people who were enslaved by Pharaoh Moses is scared and he says I'm not a good public speaker I don't know what to say I don't even know what to call you I know who you are I've seen the burning bush I've seen your great and mighty works we've conversed as much as a man can converse with Almighty God face to face we've done that I believe in you I don't know what to call you and he certainly doesn't either because he, they worship all kinds of gods and they're false gods and God says in Exodus chapter 3 he says um, you go into Pharaoh and you tell him that in my name I'm sending you well what is your name my name Moses is I am who I am that is God's personal name so back to this passage what does this have to do with anything it has everything to do with it and it's the root of where pride comes from and I'm hoping that when I now draw this distinction you'll be able to and I'll be able to better deal with this in our life when it crops up have you ever heard the expression that within a human heart or a human being there's a God-sized void that every human being fills up with something have, have you heard that before it is true I can't prove it empirically I can't prove it with scientific data or in any other concrete way but most philosophers most doctors most psychologists most people who study human nature all over the world agree that in every human being beats the idea that there is a God and even those who talk themselves into or are persuaded into believing that there is no God or there's a God and he's too remote to, to know even they are born knowing that there is a God and I will have something to do with that God when I die every human being has this no matter what culture you go to they, they explain it different ways they may call their God a different name they may have a whole different religious system I'm not saying it's right I'm just saying that within every human being beats the idea that there is a God and I will stand in front of him one day every single culture so when we started this narrative we have God doing the dictating to Moses who's writing this down so when God is dictating the narrative what does he use he uses Lord God he uses my he's saying to Moses this is my name this is my title I am the Lord God I am I am Yahweh Elohim when God has command of the narrative that's how he refers to himself now watch what happens as soon as Satan enters the picture and starts to talk to Eve what does he do right out of the chute when he's talking to Eve he doesn't say did the Lord God really say you must not eat he didn't do that did he he said did God did God really say what's he doing there he's driving a wedge into Eve's heart and later all of our hearts separating the personal God with a name that personal God who loves us personally who created us personally knowing exactly who we were he's driving a wedge between that personal God and God Almighty the the title of God 
And so every time Satan <clears throat> is talking to Eve, he's using God. Why? He can get away with it. Because everybody knows there is one. Everybody knows there's a God. Satan is not saying there is no God. He's, that's not what he's saying. He's appealing to that hole that's in every one of us that there is a God. He's not denying that. What he's doing is he's separating the personal God who loves mankind, who has a name, a personal name, that's not like any other name, because it has a meaning that no other entity could possibly ever acquire. He's driving a wedge between the personal God, Yahweh, and the title of God, Almighty God. Every time through this story, he's appealing through Eve to Adam and to the rest of us. It's okay if you believe in God. There is one. We all know that. You were born knowing that. It's okay. I'm not here to argue with you about that. Notice every time in the narrative here, I'll point it out to you so, so, so you can see it. Every time in the narrative that God takes back the narrative and he's speaking again, what does he use every single time through the rest of the chapter? What, what does he use? Lord God. Every time Satan is describing, he splits them and he says, God. And he gets Eve to buy it. He gets Eve to buy it. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say. See, she, she fell for it right away. This is not her fault. They're brand new. They're figuring this all out. We have the benefit of thousands of years of understanding things, and we have the Holy Scripture to look at and read, and we are. Don't get mad at her or Adam, but she fell for this right away. As soon as Satan dropped Lord from God and said, did God say? She bought it right away and said, yeah, God did say. Now, she didn't have any idea that what she was doing was splitting the personal God who loved her and created her from the almighty God who created the universe. I don't think she knew that she was doing that. She was just aping what Satan had said to her. Here's my whole point. If this seems to be what's happening, that there is this wedge being driven between the personal I am God who made and loves us, every one, from Almighty God who created the universe that every human being would agree is out there somewhere, then our singular vulnerability which activates our pride is we are, all human beings are living in Elohim. We're all living knowing there is a God somewhere and we might have to answer to him, but we're forgetting Yahweh. We're forgetting the personal God that has a name, that knows your name, that put your two parents together and everybody before them because he needed that unique DNA to make you. Did you know that? Some of you didn't have such great parents. Some of you did. I'm kind of a mixed bag myself, but God needed the DNA that came from my dad and my mom and, and what came before them to make me unique. He did the same for you too. That was the Yahweh God who, who is personal, has a name, knows you, and knows your name. And pride is activated in us when we are living in Elohim, but we forget about Yahweh. Ron, how, how, can you, how can you connect with those things? All right. Everybody in this room, I'm, I'm going to stand over here so that you folks don't feel left out. Everybody in this room has somebody you've looked up to in your life. Hopefully it was your parents. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was a school teacher. Maybe it was one of your coaches. Maybe it was a neighbor. Maybe it was an uncle, an aunt, a grandparent. You had somebody who was older that you even admired and looked up to. Do you, remember, do you remember those people? Keep them in your head for a minute. And think about what if you did something really awful? You either broke the law or you did something hideous and you got caught and it was splashed all over the, the news or it was known in your neighborhood. One of your first thoughts that you would have had is when you saw this person that you admired or looked up to, 
how much you let them down, right? I can remember feeling that way as a little kid. I, was, I told you before, I was a rambunctious boy. I did a lot of really fun things. I called them fun, my parents called them naughty. I don't think I ever got too far out of the box, but there was a couple of times where I did some things that when I was found out, I was embarrassed because they found out and they wanted me to live to a different standard and they expected me to do that and I failed them. Do you know that feeling? Okay, so here's the whole point. When you and I are living in our default position, our default setting of pride, we are living Elohim, but we are forgetting Yahweh. We are, we are forgetting the personal God that we know by name and we admire, who expects certain things from us, and we forget, and the relationship gets colder and older and stale, and we lose that sense of either shame or guilt or not wanting to let down the Yahweh personal God who made us. We've, we're forgetting that because we're not close to him anymore. We're not doing the things that, that keep us connected. This happens on a human level. It happens on a human level when that high school coach or that Sunday school teacher or that parent or that grandparent, when, when you're far away from them or you haven't communicated in a while and you do something really boneheaded and stupid and they find out about it, but they're too far away and it, all right, it doesn't matter, I feel ashamed, but you know, they're way over there and I'm here. And you wouldn't feel that way if that person that you admired was right here and right in front of you, where you had to go to them and say, Oh my, I was a bonehead, I am so sorry. I, you must feel so horribly let down. Fortunately, the God who made us says, I'm not let down. I wanted you to live differently for your sake. I, I know what you are and who you are. I, I know you're a sinner. You don't have to hide from me like they did back here in the garden. You don't have to turn your face away from me. Um, turn toward me, turn toward me because you will again experience the renewal of knowing your sins are forgiven because I sent my son Jesus to do that for you and once upon a time you were convinced that he did that and you trusted him as your savior and you still believe that you're a little shaky on it from time to time but you still believe that so it still applies to you the reason you and I get in trouble with pride, thinking we know better than God, or we know better about how things should go, or we want things to go a certain way in our family, and they don't, or things go awry in our lives, and, and we look back on it and we think, how could God have let this happen? And it'll particularly happen when you get a little age on you. I only use Clairol number 37 on my hair to make you think that I have gravitas and that I have maturity. But when you get a little older and things don't start to work right anymore, and your health isn't what it was when you were 25. You might be tempted to say, God, you know, I, I don't like this. I don't want this. Um, what are you doing? There's always going to be a point in time where you and I slam up against pride, where we know better than God, and, and we want to tell God how we think it should go. And we do it all kinds of ways. If you're, if you're grown like me and you have grown children and now grandchildren, you're watching your children now and then when, when they were becoming adults, they did some things that really weren't good. They weren't smart. And maybe they got into a lot of trouble. And maybe, maybe there was uh, a lot of money involved, or maybe there was incarceration, or maybe there was an addiction, or maybe a lot of things. And maybe it's happening again with some of your grandchildren. And you say, God, this, no, I, I would not have done this. I don't want this for my family. There's pride. There it is right there. I don't know why God does and allows all the things that he does. I don't have a good answer for you. I do know that it's a problem in us when we do this. And the reason we do this is because we're not as connected to the almighty God, the Yahweh Elohim that we should be. So how can we avoid being vulnerable to pride? Well, we have to practice the presence of God. Well, Pastor Ron, how, how do I do that? I mean, I, I, I try. I mean, I come to church on Sunday. I'll even come to Sunday school. How's that, God? <laughs> good for you. And good for you. You should be here on a Sunday morning whenever you can be. And even learn more about God's Word through Sunday school. But 
here, here's the first thing in practicing the, the presence of God. The first thing is by reading and learning Scripture about God and Jesus, the unique and only Son of God. You should be reading Scripture every single day. You don't have to read vast chapters. If you just read a few verses every day in an orderly way or even a disorderly way, because the Word of God is, we're told, quick and powerful, in other words, alive and it's powerful, it has the ability to search the intentions of our hearts and to get into the very core of us. Well, as you rinse through the Word of God every day, this is rinsing through you. And you are, by absorption, you are learning more and more about God. If you read the Old Testament, the theme of the Old Testament is Yahweh Elohim. That's the theme. And when you get to the New Testament, the theme is whom? Somebody say it loud. This is a Baptist church. Jesus, uh, Jesus his son. The more you read Old and New Testament, the more you will naturally absorb Elohim, Yahweh, and Yeshua, if you want this all in, in um, the ancient languages, you will absorb them every day by being in it. Some of you like to do it in an organized way. So, so some of you have a read through the Bible in one year. Some of you have engineer's minds and it has to go in that kind of an order, fine. Some of you, will take your Bible and just let it flop open. And wherever it flops open, you start reading. That's fine too. Some of you will read only Psalms. Great place to start. Some of you will read only the New Testament. Okay. Some of you like reading Genesis and the creation of all of the world. Okay. It should be rinsing through you because when it does, there's something supernatural that you're not controlling or you're not even aware of most of the time. You are being changed little by little by little and you were getting more and more in touch with Yahweh all the time. What's another way it could happen? It can happen by talking to him all the time, and it's called prayer. All right, now, now listen, I, I know that you know that the, Old or the New Testament teaches in Thessalonians, to Paul to the Thessalonian church, that we should pray without ceasing. And if you were a little kid like me, you looked at, you read that and you wondered, well, why does dad go to work? <laughs> or, you know, why is mom cooking food? If we're, if, we're, if we're supposed to pray without ceasing, that's all we do all a day? It'll take about a month and we'll all be dead. That's not what's being said there. What's being taught there and what I'm sharing today is that by learning to talk to him all the time through the day at various points, in a couple of words, a couple of sentences, it will start to connect you to this Yahweh personal God in a way that you've never experienced before. And it's a learned skill. You have to teach yourself to do this. And this is the way it probably will happen for most of us. It'll happen in your vehicle or when you're walking around your house. Uh, I'm, I'm to the point where I have to put my telephone, my, my cell phone, on the dashboard so that everybody around me when I'm at a, a traffic light sees that when I'm talking, I'm not just talking to myself and I'm crazy. There's a cell phone there and they assume that I'm talking to somebody on the cell phone. Actually, I'm talking to somebody with the biggest cell phone in the world. I'm not talking to him all the time. I'm talking to him when I'm in the car, when I'm at home, in the office. I'm talking to him whenever something pops into my mind that's connected to him somehow. And this is a learned skill, and you can learn to be really good at it. And I'll tell you one of the secrets that will help you get there fast, to be in an attitude of thanksgiving about things. I got up this morning in my hotel room, and uh, they had just done a, a complete remake of the floor that I was on. So everything is brand spanking new. And I turned the water on for the shower. Didn't get hot. And I thought, all right, well, you've taken cold showers before. You, you can do this. And as I stepped in there, after about a minute, it started getting hot. And it stayed hot. And I thank God for hot water. It can be that simple. It can be as simple as I ate dinner last night at a place that was all right. The food wasn't. It really was kind of disappointing. But I left there thanking God that I had food to eat 
because two-thirds of the world goes to bed every night not having enough food to eat. I promise you that if you learn to teach yourself to be thankful for things, and in a quick whispered prayer, in a few words or a sentence, all through your day, it will make you different, and you'll become good at it. And when you become good at it, it'll be a habit. And when that habit takes firm root in you, you are going to experience what it means to, to experience the closeness with Yahweh, not simply the Elohim who made this whole universe in whom every human, or with whom every human being wonders. It'll be more than that. Be in his word every day. I'm not trying to make this overly simplistic, but I am trying to say that this isn't that hard either. Be in his word every day and read something. And then learn to talk to him through the whole day, periodically, when it occurs to you. I wear a couple things on my wrist. I showed you one of them. But I don't know if you can see this. Can you see those two pieces of copper that are on my wrist? Strain real hard. There are two pieces of copper wire that are on my wrist. I don't wear them to make my joints feel good, although that's a happy byproduct. I wear them because they represent something that I pray for every day. And I noticed that these some things that I need to pray for, and it's things in my family. Um, when I didn't have these on my wrist, there would be a couple of few days a week that would go by and I didn't. And I put these things on my wrist to remind me every time I look at them to pray for those couple of things about a couple of things in my family. Whatever you have to do to teach yourself to become good at talking to God all through the, the day, either in your mind or out loud in the car, risking, risking people at the stoplight thinking that you're losing your mind. By the way, psychologists tell us that, that what, people that talk to themselves are the healthiest people. It's when you hear voices in your head that we should all get worried. But if you're somebody who talks to themselves about things, um, make that be you and God. You'll be the healthier for it. Pride will be tamped down in your life as you are in warmer and closer relationship to the Yahweh, not just to the Elohim. Does this all make sense? Yes? Nod your heads, and I'm really glad, because then we don't have to be here that long. I want to transition right to this table, so I'm going to call for the deacons to come forward here.